Pylons. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to begin by acknowledging that we're on the territory of the Algonquin Nation and once again express deep appreciation for their patience and generosity. Make which. Today we look at the first ever in the history of Canada tabled by a Minister of Finance economic snapshot. We used to see full budgets and we used to then have economic statements. Uh, but I am not going to find fault with the fact that we have a snapshot at the moment because it's hard to know what else we could have. More economic information is always helpful, more transparency is always helpful, and it is clear that the Minister of Finance has made himself available to all parties in this place on a very frequent basis as we chart uncharted waters. Nothing has been perfect. Everything would have been better if delivered faster. But no one's ever gone through anything like this. No other government, no other generation. I suppose we could, we could look at Black Death, but we didn't have access to Zoom meetings then, and we didn't have the ability to chart our course at all. So I would say that on balance, we've been doing as well, and in many cases better, than any government or any country around the world. That's saying something. But it's clearly a dismal economic forecast. We have now over a trillion dollars in debt, and we have a deficit this year of $343 billion. It's not going to be easy to get out of this crisis, but it's very clear that our economic health is intrinsically tied to our personal health. Comme dans le rapport, et je cite, le chemin vers la reprise demeure incertain et fondamentalement lié aux résultats en matière de santé publique, qui eux aussi sont incertains. C'est clair. Maintenant, nous vivons une pandémie. These are not normal times. This is not, this is not normal spending. Nothing is about this is normal. But it's not disastrous. We have a path out of the economic disaster that is completely dependent on our path out of the health nightmare in which we find ourselves. Il n'a jamais osé évident que l'économie passe au second plan par rapport à la nature. C'est la nature que maintenant c'est the boss. Right? We are living in a time that reminds humanity, if we needed reminding, that we're not in charge. We can have the best economic plans, we can have the best fiscal plans, we can have, as we had before this pandemic, the best debt to GDP ratio in the G7. We had full employment, we now have significant unemployment. None of this was foreseeable. A microscopic, microscopic, virus, a parasite, has attacked humanity. It leaves the animals alone for once. It's focused on humanity, and we spread it through our travel. We spread it through community spread. We've now learned all these new phrases, and we had to flatten that curve. The spending, for the most part, that we find described in this document was spending agreed to, and I think this speaks so well of us as parliamentarians, the spending was agreed to by unanimous consent. We rolled out extraordinary measures. We now know the names, the CERB, we're used to it now, our, our COVID emergency relief benefit to millions of Canadians. Rolled out help uh, to businesses in the CEBA. We rolled out help in the wage subsidy. These things have helped our economy from being worse off than we now are. It, it held the drop in GDP to probably about three points less of a drop than we would have had. That's what the economic snapshot tells us. Uh, so our economy is doing better and our health is doing better because our health and the economy are completely linked. I want to make the other point, of course, that our economy is also not in charge of the climate emergency. We as human beings can no more rewrite the genetic code of the 
COVID-19 virus, then we can rewrite atmospheric chemistry. We cannot rewrite the rules of physics that mean that the climate emergency is a larger threat to our long-term survival than COVID-19. We can revisit and potentially rewrite some of our economic rules because we made those up. Humanity invented those. We can revisit them. Uh, we can certainly, for instance, consider that now might be a good time when we talk about unprecedented threats and unprecedented economic downturn. Frequent reference has been made, including by the Parliamentary Budget Office, to the fact that the comparisons with where we are now are not against where we were in 2008, 2009, but more reasonably, the end of the Second World War and during the Second World War, our spending matches more of what we saw then. Our recovery will also match more of what we saw then, which means I mentioned in this House a few months ago, I'll mention again, I think Canada should step up in a lead role globally or at least be a catalyst in a, as a catalytic lead role and say, isn't it time to have something akin to the Bretton Woods Conference again? Don't we need to rethink what's the role of the World Bank, the Bretton Woods institutions that were created then, to help chart the global economy to recovery post-war? They worked then. International Monetary Fund set fixed currency rates. Since that Bretton Woods institutions and since that conference, the IMF has been relieved of, of fixing currency rates. We rewrote those rules. Maybe we need to rewrite some other rules. We are looking at a threat to life globally around the world in a post-pandemic famine threat to hundreds of millions of people around the world. And I know it's conventional wisdom for Canadians to say, we can't ask people when they're suffering in Canada to think about the poorest of the poor, but I think we have to. We will emerge from this crisis, this economic crisis, and the COVID-19 crisis better off than most any other country on Earth. And if hundreds of millions of people are dying from lack of food all around the world, that will not, keep, that will not <laughs> fail to reach our shores somehow. But we also have a role to play. And I think we really need to talk about uh, uh, forgiving all developing country debt from all around the world so these countries that are the poorest of the poor have a fighting chance with additional help for food security to avoid the deaths of hundreds of millions of people, which are now predicted by United Nations uh, relief and food agencies. We also need to rethink the fairness within Canada. This document makes it very clear that Finance Canada understands the need for child care as I have never seen any Finance Canada document understand the need for child care. It's clear that people who are looking at our economic health and recovery understand that parents can't go back to work if, if schools are closed or if schools aren't safe or if daycares aren't open or if they don't have a daycare space. And as I say parents, and it happens there are a number of women MPs at the House at the moment, don't think it fails, and men who understand it too. Thank you to my honorable colleague who is smartly masked. Women, mothers, are the ones who are more likely to be staying home. This is a threat, a demographic threat, an economic threat, that likes of which we haven't seen since the 1960s. The idea that, well, if things are bad and there's no child care, women will stay home. We know that's an economic blow we can't risk, and we know that's a step back in women's rights that we won't accept. We need child care for every child, and we need to be really creative about how we get there. This document points to what's called the Safe Restart Agreement. That is the $14 billion not yet allocated, not yet spent by the federal government to assist provinces. But $14 billion will not cover the seven items on this list. Child care, sick leave, health care capacity, and specifically looking at long-term care homes. I recently was talking to Shauna Stewart, who's the head of the union that represents long-term care workers across Canada, 60,000 workers. She told me that most of those workers are not yet back at work because they don't think the long-term care homes are a safe place for them to work. 
as long as long-term care homes are in the hands of for-profit enterprises, we cannot be sure that our seniors are going to be well cared for, nor that the workforce who goes in to take care of them, the frontline workers there, are safe, not to mention what kind of food people are served when you decide that you can cut corners every which way to make a profit in a long-term care home. We need to take a look at this federally. We need to figure out how we make Canada Health Act apply for national standards for long-term care homes. There's not enough money in this $14 billion, even for what the municipalities need by themselves, and they're one item out of seven on the list. We need to do more. We need to be prepared to spend more. So with that, I'm, I'm going to focus as well on a point made earlier by my colleague um, from, uh, from Burnaby. We still, although it's mentioned in here as though it's spent, we still have not done a single thing for people with disabilities. My, I, my colleague from New Westminster, Burnaby, I'm afraid I abbreviated the name of his, his, his writing. The document we have in front of us was written as though the events on June 10th in this place had gone differently. June 10th in this place, the government agreed to split out of a bill that was not acceptable because it involved clawbacks and criminal penalties related to CERB. That was the main thing I found objectionable. But the one-time tax-free payment for Canadians with a valid disability tax credit, in order to be able to do that, we needed to make a legislative change in this place so that that information could be shared from CRA so that the one-time tax credit benefit could go to people receiving the disability tax credit. Bear in mind, that's the, that is not the full range of people living with disabilities in Canada who need help, but at least it was a step, and I wanted to take that step. And when we asked for unanimous consent, we didn't get it. Shame on those who said no. We had that one step to take the, the Liberal House leader put it before us for unanimous consent, and it should have gone through. But we have to figure out how to get help to people with disabilities, and we have to do it quickly. Those, there are a number of areas that remain un, un, unmet, needs that are unmet, and that's in the context of the immediate crisis. When we get past the immediacy of the crisis and build towards restarting our economy, that's where I think we really need to think big. I don't know how many of you noticed the column by Brian Mulroney that appeared as a full page ad in the Globe and Mail, the back page of one day's paper a few weeks ago. I was pleased to see him call for guaranteed livable income. That's one of the things that I think my colleagues, they're all shaking, their, they're all agreeing uh, from the benches of the New Democratic Party and Greens. We are firm in our desire to see the CERB transfer over time and quickly uh, to a guaranteed livable income. In the other place, uh, the leader of the independent Senate group asked the parliamentary budget office to look at this and found it would be cheaper than CERB to do it. But that's even without taking into account the savings that would accrue to our public health care system, to our correction system. We need to move to guaranteed livable income as part of the next transformative step um, the Honourable Member from New, West New Westminster Burnaby talked about what happened in this House in the late 1960s, early 70s, when Tommy Douglas and David Lewis and in the, in the government of the Honourable Lester, B right Honourable Lester B. Pearson, put in place the fundamentals of our social safety net. We haven't taken a significant transformative step since. We need to bring in pharmacare. We need to bring in guaranteed livable income. These are the steps that we need when we reimagine our future post-pandemic. We can build back to build back better. We can make sure we don't bounce back but bounce forward. There are many ways that the phrases are circulating these days in a very active, robust discussion. But that discussion isn't on the fringes when it's Brian Mulroney, our former Prime Minister, progressive conservative, talking about what we need to do, that we need to think big, that we need to be bold. I really loved his takeaway line, quote, incrementalism builds increments. We are not in a place right now, dear friends, to build increments. We need to rebuild our economy. 
We need to restart our economy, and we need to do it in a way that leaves no one behind, including the poorest of the poor wherever they are around the world. We need to step up and take a role that says the climate agenda can't wait. The climate emergency doesn't wait. The climate negotiations for 2020 are postponed till 2021. But if we decide that climate action can also be postponed to 2021, we will certainly play a dangerous game of Russian roulette with our children's future. We need to ensure that as we go forward, and yes, we will need to continue spending, that we invest in renewable energy, in energy efficiency for all of our buildings in retrofits, and we need to also look at things according to global studies on what stimulates the economy best, gets people back to work, and makes a big difference, including things as simple as tree planting. Lots of it. So as I look at this economic and fiscal snapshot, I have to say that I find it encouraging. Very few people could look at a fiscal snapshot that says $343 billion deficit and find it encouraging. But we're facing it. And in looking at the economic indicators and our own strength as a nation in being able to handle this, we can. We are, we are very, very fortunate that we went into this with the economic health and the strength that we did. We have a lot of companies that are still struggling. We mustn't let, if we can help it, we have to help avoid bankruptcies. We have to help small business. We have to ensure our municipalities receive the help they need. And to do that, the federal government must continue to spend. To do otherwise, to be frightened by people who say, well, look at the red ink, is to risk a deep depression. We are going to have to continue to go down this road. And the best way to do that, I believe now, is to look at modern monetary theory and ask ourselves why we want to borrow from commercial banks when, as long as we're dealing with sovereign wealth and sovereign debt, we can borrow from ourselves and keep those funds within Canada and not let us be at the mercy of commercial banks or New York bond raiders. It's time to say, what do we do as a sovereign nation how do we embrace our future and do it without the I don't want to say bean counter, narrow-minded, lack of vision kinds of folks out there. I want to say, let's be as positive about this as we can be. Let's be innovative. When we look at the problem, for instance, for schools opening, we know that schools can't open because there's not enough space to have physical distancing for the children because the schools are small compared to what's going to be needed. We've got to stop thinking about jurisdictional barriers and be really creative. Where is there a lot of empty space for school children? I think it's the convention centers that are going to stay empty. Can't we think past our own jurisdictional constitutional boundaries for once and say, this is an emergency. If we want kids back at school and we want teachers back teaching them, which is what teachers want, where do we have assets that can be mobilized quickly? It's now early July. Schools are supposed to open in September. Nobody really has a plan that I can see. So yes, we need childcare. Yes, we need our schools opening. Yes, we need to work together federally, provincially, municipally, with indigenous governments, Métis, Inuit, First Nations. Every set of smart, innovative, creative Canadians need to come to the table. And when we come to the table, let's come not ready to bash each other down, but help bring each other up. Because as Canadians, we know we are blessed. We know we've gotten, we are not out of the woods yet, we know that. But we're smart enough to know we listen to the science. We have to listen to the science on COVID-19. We have to listen to the science on the climate emergency. And we have to look to those who are the most innovative, the most creative throughout our economy. And with that, I want to thank you for the opportunity for sharing some thoughts about this snapshot, which I hope I have delivered back to everyone and what we no longer have, Kodak uh, full-color spectrum uh, 
Coda Chrome. Thank you. Questions and comments? Question et commentaire, the Honourable Member for Long Range Mountains. And I'll be Pleasure to listen to my friend and colleague from Sandwich Gulf Islands. Um, I'm on one coast of this country and she's on the other. Um, I've been in Ottawa the last couple of days with another colleague on FIWO status of women meetings, and it was very clear that we heard the impact that COVID-19 has had on women from coast to coast to coast. Indigenous women, women of colour, women in um, the new workforce, women in the old workforce. And we also heard the Finance Minister make mention of that today, the impact that COVID-19 is having severely on women in, in our country. Um, I'd like to ask my honourable colleague, going forward, as we look down the road of recovery, what advice does she have for my minister, the Minister of Women and Gender Equality, of how we get um, women back on the level playing field and how we, we get our economy going, knowing that women is a good part of it? Well, member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Well, I want to thank my friend from um, Long Range Mountains. The, the, this is, document is exceptional for the depth of analysis on gender-based analysis of a statement. I don't think I've ever seen Annex one of this for, for people uh, watching us from home is taking it program by program, sector by sector, how has the COVID-19 epidemic affected, pandemic affected women? So the gender-based assessment is clear. I would say the answer is three things, childcare, childcare, childcare. Women are right now are at risk of being put back in the home because there's no one else to look after the kids and we need childcare. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfit. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, and I appreciate a couple of, uh, of the, the attitudes that the Honourable Member mentioned in her speech, and that's the need for creativity and the need to be positive. And uh, when it comes to the need for creativity, I wish there was more creative thinking in, in terms of making sure that Parliament could have sat over the last three months so we could have had fulsome and regular debates, including private members' business and whatnot, over these past number of months as this country faced an unprecedented crisis. And, uh, and, and certainly, when it comes to the attendance, when it comes to the attendance of of members. I know a number of members that are not listed in the, the minutes as some of my other colleagues have mentioned because they had to watch on CPAC because of technical challenges. So I wish that creativity could have been exercised in this place. But specifically to my honourable friend uh, across the way, I think that, uh, that unleashing that positive entrepreneurial spirit is absolutely key to a good recovery. And I know that there are many examples specifically within the energy sector in my constituency, cutting edge environmental science that is moving our world-class energy industry forward, but we need a plan to move forward. And unfortunately, the fiscal update today did not outline a plan to move forward. It was simply that looking back. And I wonder if the member agrees that over the last number of months, the 700 plus staff in the Department of Finance could have been working on a budget that certainly I would have been happy to sit this summer in debate so that we as Canadians and as members of Parliament could see the plan for this country going forward as opposed to a fiscal selfie that simply talks about the 350 some billion dollars deeper in the red that will be. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you. I thank my friend for Battle River Crowfit for giving me the perfect opportunity to say I, I can't imagine how we could be sitting physically in this place without being a threat to the health of the people in our communities at home and to our own health. And I don't understand why the Conservatives persist in saying we could be sitting here. All we need, and I'm begging the Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot to be the voice of reason within his caucus, let us vote remotely. We're voting from home in British Columbia's legislature, which includes some very far-flung areas. We are voting remotely in British Columbia. Other countries are voting remotely. If we could vote remotely, we could bring forward private members' bills. We could bring forward the bill that's languishing for medical assistance in dying reform, which is desperately needed. We could be bringing forward the legislation we need for a Climate Accountability Act. We are, we are, we are in this place unable to pass something as simple as allowing the Government of Canada to have eyes on who receives the disability tax credit because of a refusal to go with unanimous consent. We need to vote remotely in a pandemic, not otherwise, but in a pandemic, we need to function fully. Questions and comments? Question and commentaire, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to, to comment um, 
and ask a few questions of the minister or the member from Saanich Gulf Islands. Uh, I, was, I was moved by the, the comments we've heard from, from the member for Burnaby South, the new, new Westminster Burnaby, and, and the member from Saanich Gulf Islands. In terms of building back better, in terms of our opportunity to do this, one of the things that I notice is that what we have right now is a global pandemic and it will require a global response. And we understand that, that we can't stop the pandemic if we, if we try to be um, insular within Canada. So I really did appreciate the comments that the member made, but I wonder if she would agree with me that we would love to see a recommitment to the sustainable development goals. It's the high level political forum at the United Nations right now, virtually of course, uh, but whether or not we should be reconfirming to our commitment to the sustainable development goals and whether we could have a 1% of our COVID spending, just 1% of our COVID spending going to help those around the world that are suffering so much at this time. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you. And I want to also thank the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona for her leadership on the issues that relate to ending poverty globally. Uh, I do wear the pin, that this pin for people who are wondering, uh, the public health officer for the province of Quebec wears it. So people say to me, whoa, where did you get that from Quebec? This is the 17 sustainable development goals and Canada is committed to them. We should recommit and it is absolutely appropriate to say we should, our goal should be 0.7% long term of our GNI going to overseas development assistance. And in this pandemic, 1% of COVID spending should go, must go to meeting the sustainable development goals. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Fleetwood Port Kells. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Interesting statistic uh, out of the Surrey Board of Trade in British Columbia. Since the pandemic, uh, BC has lost about 350,000 jobs. But of that, about 250,000, or about 72%, represent people in precarious work. And I think we can do better. As we go forward, and I'd like the honorable member from uh, Saanich and Gulf Islands to, to comment on this, we can do better for them, not just for them individually, but as people who represent a wasted resource in Canada. This is human energy that we're frittering away on work of relatively low value. And I'm wondering what she would see in the future that would lift these people up and lift all of Canada up along with them. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. I thank my Honourable Friend from Fleetwood Port Kells. He's, he's absolutely right. We've, we've talked about this before, that what we accepted as normal in the past wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough in terms of long-term care homes. It wasn't good enough in terms of people being left behind in our economy, falling through the cracks. It wasn't good enough for people dealing with the opioid crisis. And for particularly young people, there are a lot of people in what gets called now the gig economy. No job security very precarious circumstances. One of the best ways to deal with this is guaranteed livable income. That everybody knows they've got enough for, for their bare, bare maintenance needs to stay above the poverty line, and then you earn income beyond that. We're also, we're going to be hit. I mean, the world of work was gonna change soon anyway, and the Canadian Labour Congress did a big study on this by artificial intelligence. We have to plan ahead for some rather large headwinds that we still haven't faced. And one of them is, is AI, the other is the climate emergency, and we continue to deal with pandemic. It means, I think, we, we create a social safety net that really does ensure that everybody is at least able to keep a roof over their head and their kids fed. And after that, you keep working and you figure out how you're gonna make money, whether you're, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a frontline healthcare worker, you need to know that you're, that you're not so precarious that it would only mean one lost paycheck and you fall between the cracks. Questions and comments? We have time for about a 30 second question and maybe a 30 second answer. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My colleague raised many issues. I just wanted to pick up on the issue of long-term care, clearly an, an important issue, and we have to think about how we do better, how we support people better. And I think sometimes we get caught in this dichotomy between private for-profit and public provision, forgetting that a lot of services are delivered through private 
not-for-profit. And when you have private not-for-profits, there's, there's generally so much more engagement of volunteer hours, involvement in the community. Uh, this can produce uh, very good outcomes. But we also have a problem, and it's represented uh, by the Delta Hospice, which is close to where the member uh, maybe gets off when she's taking the ferry to Vancouver, which is that when there is a threat to the ability of institutions to exist according to their own values, to, to define the protection of their own conscience, that drives certain organizations out of participation in private not-for-profit care. Uh, would the member agree that we want to increase the involvement of private not-for-profits? And one way to do that is to ensure the protection of conscience for those that are volunteering their time and efforts in order to provide a good long-term care for our seniors. Good question. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands in 30 seconds or less. I have just enough time to thank the Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. No, I think I have a little bit more time than that. I couldn't agree more about the role played by private not-for-profit. There are wonderful care homes in my riding operated not by government agencies, obviously, but by non-profit societies. And I do agree we need to protect rights of conscience for individual workers. At the institutional level, it becomes far more difficult, and I think we will part company on the questions relating to some of the, uh, of the tangential, but perhaps core elements of why he asked the question. I agree we need to look at non-profit privately run healthcare facilities and really celebrate the work of the volunteers in those facilities.